Our text today is from the epistle of Hebrews in the first chapter. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. The book of Hebrews has been called the forgotten epistle in the New Testament. It is not much talked about in the daily life of the church. And if it is anybody's favorite book of the Bible, I have never heard of it. The book of Hebrews is a book of comparisons. The word better, as in better than, occurs 13 times. But the comparisons are not always familiar to us. And the logic is foreign to our Western ways of thinking. But the pointing finger on every page directs you to the adequacy, the sufficiency, the superiority of Christ Jesus, who is better than anyone or anything you will find anywhere else. The author does not waste time introducing himself or his readers to you. He pours all of his energies into the very first sentence and does not let up until the end. God, who in various times and in diverse manners spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. If God is a God at all, he has to speak and communicate to his people. If God is at all Father, he has to guide and direct his children. God has spoken in times past through the prophets. That's what the word prophet means. One who speaks out or one who speaks for God. God spoke to Adam and Eve of one who would crush the serpent's head to Abraham and Sarah of a descendant in whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. God spoke to Noah through the rainbow in the sky, to the man Job out of a whirlwind, to Jacob in a dream of angels, to Moses from a burning bush, to Balaam out of the mouth of a donkey, to Elijah in a still, small voice, and to Hosea through an unfaithful wife. God spoke to Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel in unforgettable visions of fire and splendor, and to the hearts of countless people since in the prayers and poetry of the Psalms. God also spoke in other ways, without using words, the way lovers might speak to each other with a touch or a kiss, or the way a man might single a thumbs up to a friend, but a clenched fist to an enemy. God spoke to them through the wonders of nature and through the voice of conscience in every man's soul. He spoke to them in peaceful times and fruitful seasons. And he spoke to them in famine and pestilence and drought and disease and the horrors of war and cruel conquerors. 
God spoke to the fathers in one voice and then in another voice. But the problem always was putting all of the voices into the choir. Making all of the bits and pieces fit into a complete picture. That's why the text tells us God who at various times and diverse manners spake in times past to the fathers through the prophets hath in these last days spoken to us by his son. The son is God's last best word. The son is the heart of the Christian faith and the good news of the gospel. Christ is the last in a long line of prophets but in a category by himself. Christ stands in a unique relationship to God that no prophet ever had as God's own son. And Christ could claim what the best prophet and preacher on earth could never claim. All things are delivered unto me of my father. And no man knoweth the son but the father. And neither knoweth any man the father save the son and he to whomsoever the Son shall reveal him. The Son of God is God's final, ultimate, once and for all word to us. So John introduced his gospel with those very lines. In the beginning was the word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So said the Baptist. No man hath seen God at any time, but the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. God has given us his ultimate Word in Christ. Nothing more needs to be said. Nothing more can be said. That's how you can identify the false prophets of your day. David Koresh down in Texas, Oral Roberts on TV. They claim God is still speaking to them. When God claims he's given you his last word in his son Jesus, and what a word it is. Listen to this. God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, and by whom the world was made. Christ Jesus is the heir. That means that this world was made with Christ in mind. That all things ultimately belong to him. As St. Paul said, the whole creation is groaning in childbirth till Christ comes again and claims it as his own. Christ is the heir of all things. Now, who better can tell you the reason for your existence? He's the heir, then you're the inheritance. That means that after all that Christ has said and done, all he gets for his efforts is us. And he thinks that's a good deal. Christ is the heir, no wonder. He moved through, so comfortably through this world he lived in. He did not bemoan the poverty of Bethlehem. 
and did not begrudge the rich young ruler his wealth. Why should he? He is the heir of all things. He draw no distinction between the faded woman at the well of Samaria, the old scholar Nicodemus who came by night, or the infants whom mothers laid in his arms. Why should he? He is the heir of all things. He was equally at home in the carpenter's shop of Nazareth, on a mountainside in Galilee, in a fisher boat on the lake, or in the infirmary at Bethesda. He is the heir of all things. And by him the world was made. God could have made the world without his son. But the Bible tells us that God did not do that. There was nothing made apart from or without God's Son. The modern mind, of course, tends to reduce the world in which we live into basic matter, energy, chemical, and mathematical formulas. And all scientists tell us, whether they turn their telescopes to the distant galaxies, or focus their microscopes on the tiniest organisms, the more you discover, the more mysterious and marvelous it all is. Who else can interpret for you how this world works? Better than the one by whom and for whom it was all made. You want to know what makes a relationship work in this world? And what breaks one up? What other authority could tell you that than the one who made it? And you, you, you pick up on it. Jesus walks the dusty roads. He points to the lilies in the nearby fields and the birds building nests in the branches. Of course, your father cares for them. And of course, your father cares for you. He saw something entirely appropriate, but why shouldn't he set it up this way? About the happiness of a man and a woman on their wedding day. Or the peaceful sleep of a weary laborer at night, or children playing their games out in the street. He could take the most commonplace things you can think of. A woman in her kitchen, kneading leaven into a batch of dough. A farmer out there in the field sowing seeds. The fruitfulness of a fig tree in season. That's it. That's the way I set it up. That's just like my kingdom. But it's more than that. He is the brightness of God's glory and the express image of his person. Just as the sunshine radiates from the sun, which is its source, so Jesus is the glory of of God the Father. But what kind of glory is it? Is it the kind of glory that so impresses us? This blinding pomp and circumstance, this dazzling ceremony and splendor. No, his is a lovely glory. Doesn't need to show off. Impress other people. It's a kindly kind of light that warms us and lights our path and makes life beautiful for us. He is the express image of the person of God. 
He's the very stamp of God. He is the very nature of God. So that if you people want to know what God is like, what God thinks of you, what God expects of you, what God has planned for you, look long at Jesus. Remember at the Last Supper, Philip blurts out, Oh, Master, show us the Father, and it will be enough for us. Jesus was plainly taken aback, turned to his friend and said, Philip, have I been so long with you and you still haven't picked up on it? He that has seen me has seen the Father. Like the little boy in Bible school said, looking at the religious painting, Jesus is the best picture God ever had took. And he upholds all things by the power of his word. Without the Son, of God, the world would fly apart. He's built his saving principles into the way this world works. Haven't you ever noticed that? How the rainfall falls on the just and on the unjust. How the sun shines upon the good and the evil. I grew up in a city. And to me, the weather was something that canceled the baseball game or had you out there handling a snow shovel. So it surprised me to find out how the ranchers and farmers out west saw so plainly the hand of God in the sunshine and the rainfall and spoke so openly of working in harmony with the seasons which God lets come and go. And even a tornado would scare the daylights out of me. Even a tornado, if it came to that, was for them nothing but the chariot of God, like the whirlwind that took Elijah to heaven. Have you never noticed the watchful care of a mother hen over her baby chicks? Or a young woman with new life cradled in her arm? How even bad fathers know how to give good gifts unto their children. Have you never noticed how the dawn always comes after the dark of night and the springtime after the dead of winter. And the labor, pain of childbirth brings new life into this world. And the seed decaying in the ground produces a new creation. And even the dry earth, which breaks and cracks, is hoping and waiting for the refreshing rainfall from the sky. And lastly this, he made purification for our sins and sat down on the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Sin is spoken of as something that makes us unclean, sordid, and dirty. All sinners feel that. And the cry of Lady Macbeth is universal. What? Shall these hands of mine never be clean? We cannot live with each other without cleansing. And it's a cinch we cannot live with God without cleansing. We long for a lost purity, long for cleansing, somebody to wipe the slate clean so we can begin again and breathe again. And that's what Jesus did. 
And when he had done it, he sat down on the right hand of the majesty. Sitting down implies that his work was done, finished, completed, the way I sit down in a big easy chair after Sunday services. Only he sat down on the right hand of the majesty and see the preeminence and power and certainly as the judge of the living and the dead. God, who in various times and in diverse manners spake in times past to the fathers through the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by the Son. There is no doubt of that. The only question is, are we listening? Amen.